there we go. Sweet. So this will be the fourth meeting. It's going to be kind of another more technical dive in along with a brief status update kind of to put at the front of this. I think we have scared away a lot of the non-technical people with the message about the meeting being technical. That's fine. <laughs> um, but I guess just bigger picture that they may have been interested in for anybody that's catching up and just wants a status update. Um, the branding, actually, I'll just flip to this temporarily. Um, we've done a lot of branding presentation stuff and we are starting to share a brand assets package. There's been a couple people uh, like the ENF has asked for it. So we passed that along um, for the video interviews that came out recently. But we also are going to have a PDF now and we're packaging all of that up into just a zip file that will be distributed on the website. And it is going to explain the brand, explain how to use the brand, do's and don'ts, uh, everything that you kind of expect to be able to hand to a designer that wants to leverage this brand for whatever they need to do with it. Um, like a branding page, so to speak, like where people can grab your logos. And, yep. And things of the yep. Sort. Okay. Yeah, there will be a page. The page will probably be pretty light, but then there will be a zip file that people can download um that has all of that stuff and maybe the pdf will be directly linked there as well uh, i just saw the first revision of the pdf earlier this week uh we're doing some editing on it and then i think the next step will be to figure out where it lives on the website which kind of leads nicely into the next thing that we've been working on uh we spent many hours over the last week um brainstorming, kind of whiteboarding, and figuring out the complete site map of what the wharfkit.com website is going to be. Uh, we have some pretty good ideas. They're still really rough, and we're still just like moving effectively post-it notes around into different categories and whatever. Um, but I will probably put a message out in Telegram that maybe we'll do either one of these calls or uh, maybe a standalone call of some sort to offer anybody that wants to be involved in kind of the evolution of that and what belongs where um, to join in the discussion. I know we've already come down on certain topics like our original audience was kind of like developers that are familiar with web technologies that want to get started with antelope, like any antelope chain. But when they get to the website, like we're only going to be presenting them with one aspect of all of this, which is the client side development of it. And then we're going to need to be able to direct um, users to places where they can learn the other side, doing the smart contract development, the deployment, that kind of stuff, uh, since that's out of scope for this project. I think currently we may have dropped a link to the, the new doc portal that you're working on, Nathan. Um, but we're going to need to be able to do that for lots of different chains as well just so that way if somebody well, does end up there is work, a there is a docs.antelope.io as well oh cool that might be a really good one as well um but that's exactly the kind of input i think we're looking for is we're going to have some users that their story is going to be that they yeah they're interested in wharf but they're also going to need something else that the wharfkit.com website's not going to it's not going to teach them about. So we need to make sure we have the funnel to put them in the right place to learn about that. And then vice versa on those other portals, if there's a way to weave it back to this, then you know, we create this pretty good user experience. Um, our main reference point has been other front end frameworks. Like if you go to like React's website or Svelte's website or something, like they very clearly tell you, you know, you're going to be working on client library code here. Like we're going to be building your client. And then they don't even mention the fact that, you know, oh, you might need an API or you might need a database or some sort of backend service. I don't think we have the luxury of being able to just exclude that and expect that developers coming into this space know that they need something else. So I think throughout all the different documentation for the different aspects of the ecosystem, we're going to need to do some like intelligent linking back and forth, some good messaging. So that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, yeah, especially in this case, uh, it's not like <clears throat> in this case, it's not like React, where it's you know, like very uh, like can be con connected to a million different you know databases and APIs. Like they, they can't really add that info. But in our case, the wallet is meant to act as antelope chains, 
and the uh, typical user is going to be a developer of the like the wharf uh, and that wants to look into the the site and everything so it just makes sense for sure you need to link back to the to the rest of you know uh, like the actual documentation yeah I Very think much. there's also a really good chance there's a many to many relationship here where um like EOS is going to have some kind of snippet which is specifically targeted around the EOS starter kit. Uh Wax will probably do the same. Uh, you know, UX, Telos, they're all gonna have that, which will push people into this. And then this could also push people out to either Antelope or to all of the other chains. Possibly to each other. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's, all chains will link back to Worf, but I don't know if Worf makes sense to link back to all the other chains. Um, but just as my thought, it kind of has to, because if it doesn't, then how? If somebody lands only on Worf, how are they supposed to? But use how will he land Worf? there? How will he land there? Like the only reason I see somebody like landing on it is picking up that name because he's trying to develop something. And somebody tells him like this is the library you want to use and at that point he's already developing for one of the chains like i'd, I'd imagine you know so unless what, he landed by mistake what would wharf go to antelope itself yeah i think wharf should stay neutral in that like uh, obviously it's up to you guys but like my my view of it is this is like uh, an sdk or you know like that you need to kind of use that interacts with antelope chains so it could have a place where it says like you know, it's used now in these antelope chains or something along those lines, if it wants to kind of link to them. But it's not like, I don't think somebody's going there to Worf to get redirected to like just general page about like a, a blockchain. Right. Uh, they're more interested in general docs, like antelope docs, like you said, and other things that's very useful. But I don't think anything specific to, uh, to a particular antelope uh, deployment makes sense to be there like uh, i just don't see the like necessarily the value there's there's a value for the chains like you know for us ux like great yeah like we'll welcome it but getting I, I, that like, traffic yeah yeah but like i just think it's it's not really where it should be maybe one way we could tackle this is uh once the different chains have starter kits whether we're developing it or whether the chains develop it and follow along that Anytime a chain makes a starter kit, then we can have kind of a listing for that starter kit. So that way, if developers, uh, they end up on Wharf somehow because they're um, looking for Web3 development, and they're like, oh, this looks like a cool framework to do this on, um, that they could be like, oh, here's starter kits for individual networks, and right. I could browse in that way. Um, there will be other I mean, in any case yeah. those are going to have, have to be the there nets and the main nets as well so yeah. that would be actually a smart way to include them yeah it's not as on the nose as saying hey you know go check out these blockchains but it's saying hey we've developed this this is part of our stack therefore we must explain it on our documentation yeah and there's going to be other generic starter kits like a view starter kit or a svelte or a react starter kit that's right. just like you know, we're gonna we're just gonna bake jungle into it or something, or some test net that could be modified. Um, and the point is to get you building a front end app uh, rather than getting started on a specific network. That could be potentially a later leg of that developer's journey. Yeah, that's a great idea. Where having Wharf is like one of the starting steps for like a developer uh, because it's. You know, it's easier for the average developer who's, you know, mostly seen only JavaScript to kind of uh, jump into this. And then, like you said, have like jungle or something, not necessarily baked in, but available as an option or something. Uh, and then the user can, you know, literally just start like here, the, the, like you add it a tutorial, you know, on how to use it. And this tutorial, you know, interacts with like jungle using the smart contract that's already deployed and whatnot and is able to do like whatever the tutorial is trying to achieve or, or show off the use case of. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll have, I think, kind of a rough draft of the site map in the coming weeks. I don't know if it'll happen before the holidays, but it's something that we're kind of actively pushing on right now. Um, and this sort of feedback is awesome to help evolve that. I'll definitely bring this back to the team, or maybe I'll just tell the team to like check out this recording um 
and then start to get, get their jobs. thoughts and implement. Yeah. What was that? I'm saying get them to start watching to get the views up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All those YouTube views. Smash that like button. <laughs> Don't forget oh. to subscribe. Yeah, right. The most nerdy videos we could possibly hope to get any views on. Um, so yeah, uh, the brand stuff, the website's coming along nicely. We're going to kind of piecemeal the website together as we go. Uh, we have kind of an idea of what the next iteration of the website looks like. So you can see on the, the milestones itself, the website is far out from completion. Um, but that, like almost everything else here, doesn't mean we're not we're not going to have anything for that amount of time. Um, it's going to be this thing that grows and evolves up until that point in time when it's complete. So hopefully um, we'll be able to have some useful content on there soon. Um, one of the things that will probably be on there first is the, the session kit and some examples and some plugins. Uh, we're kind of focused on Within this milestone two, we're talking about the basis of the kits themselves, which is what we're still working on. The dates obviously passed. We're kind of targeting more close towards the end of the year right now. Um, these are kind of the bare bones kits. And I guess to describe that a little bit better, the session kit. The session kit is going to come out as its first release. Uh, maybe it's like an 0.1 release or something. And it will be for Node.js contexts. Like you're going to write a bot, you're going to write a script, you're going to do something in Node.js that uh, uses the session kit. That'll be the first kind of shown use case and first maybe uh, trial run for us to start documenting things on the website. And then really getting developers involved, trying to get them using it, and then seeing where the pain points are, which is kind of a, that, that'll be the later half of this after I get done kind of with the various updates on the little parts, um, we'll dive a little bit deeper into where the session kit is right now. Uh, I guess other updates is that the contract kit is coming along. We have the way to think about the contract kit at this point is, is it's kind of a code generator. It's going to generate code to put into projects for people. And the account kit is actually going to leverage that code generation um, to have more easy access to the system contract actions that we all use to manage accounts. Uh, it's meant to obscure that a little bit, I guess, to dive into the technical side of that just a little bit. Uh, do I have this thing? I wrote a utility just yesterday that sets up a whole bunch of test accounts. We're going to have these are going to be on jungle Four. We have a bunch of test accounts that are all going to have different states of how they use the blockchain. The top five have tokens, the bottom five don't. And then there's this matrix of whether they have CPU, net, and RAM. So that way we can test how the kit performs against a, an account in that state. Like this one's going to be out of RAM, but it has CPU, net, and tokens. Like, how does the session kit react to this situation? How does it handle errors? How does it help the user correct that problem? Um, that's kind of aside from the point, but to kind of illustrate where the account kit and the contract are going to be helpful is things like this file. Um, so the test accounts that it's making. This gigantic spaghetti mess of JSON is what the account kit will help address. Um, you can see it's generating the actions. If you are familiar with EOS IO transactions, it should all look familiar. It's making the new account. It is buying the RAM. It is transferring tokens. It is staking CPU and net. Like this is all the boilerplate that developers have to write out. And I'm <laughs> Copilot was actually really good at helping me do this. I mean, from memory, I might have gotten close, but Copilot like really helped drive home that like here's the fields you need, which was awesome. Um, but you develop... realize how much you need Copilot in order to do that. Yeah, yeah. And this is I I messaged the team afterwards with this the commit for this, and I was just like, tell me that I can use the account kit for this script because this is ridiculous. I as a developer 
shouldn't need to know how to do all of this. Like I should just be able to say, right. I want to delegate bandwidth and I want to put this much into CPU and this much into that. Like that realistically should be the end of it. So walking that back a little bit, the, the contract kit is going to generate kind of system contract scaffolding for the account kit. And the account kit is going to help abstract all of this nonsense away from developers. So that way, you know, we don't have to write this. So code. what are we, what are the, okay. So let me see if I get this right for the account kit. We're abstracting away the authorizations, correct? Uh, it is everything kind of related to you to an account and the system contracts. So balances, um, so CLIOS permissions, kind of resources. Mm. What was that? So like CLIOS system, you know, like yeah. uh, when you're running like it's like CLIOS system stuff, but like even like simpler because there you still need to put obviously all the fields, and it's worse because you know when you have like data fields and stuff, but. Uh, but basically, what you're talking about, like the the actions related to the system, which usually lie in Clio's system. Yep. But, but it's not going to be uh, inherently using your account for the from. Uh, it can, I guess. I think what he's saying is like account.netstake or 0 0.000 EOS, right? So it's going to be kind of same idea where you have like defaults right like if you don't enter okay. anything uh like or you don't pass additional fields or i'm not still yeah, yeah, sure yeah. how like the, the, the like the from account might be an people. optional and it defaults to yours exactly something along those lines same with authorization might default to active and the account name and sure. you know all that kind of stuff while giving you that flexibility if you want to add like five authorizations like uh, obviously it shouldn't limit the flexibility of usi uh, antelope but it should just simplify 99% of the use cases, which most right. people don't even use this right. stuff. But. Sure, sure. Yeah, that is, it's basically turning, it's generating code to create methods to make creating that data easier. Um, I think there's some stubs. This isn't a public repo yet, but. Um, so we, we had talked about this uh, before. You're. You're saying it would happen the same way that like the very old first version of ESJS would have done it. I like, refresh my memory. Uh, it would create JavaScript objects from the ABI. So you'd have dot notation for actions. It would be like EOSIO dot uh, delegate underscore BW or delegate Something BW. Similar to that. Yeah. This is a kind of a. This is not code generic. generic. Yeah, I think uh, just to Nathan's point, I think what he's talking about is more like what you mentioned as part of the contract kit for non-system contracts. I think right. uh, here in system contracts, maybe you think of something simpler like new account or you know just like I don't know uh, stake. Well, you know, like the reason I'm bringing it up is because yeah. there was um, back early when that that. Um, EOSJS. Early version, yeah, that early version of EOSJS existed. It was a little bit problematic because it was embedded within the actual library. It wasn't that specific contract, the system contract wasn't generated from the ABIs. Uh, so when system contracts were updated, there yeah. was always behind. And I'm wondering yeah. if we're going to replicate that now. It might. And hmm. I think it will be, this is kind of an optional path to make the development easier for like you're still always going to be able to do it by hand if you need to do it but the code that's generated comes out of the ABI and then it's not part of wharf exactly i mean if it's the account kit then yeah we're kind of maintaining a copy of this for um, some common system actions but if it like if it's atomic assets and there is an atomic assets uh, kit of some kind um then yeah whenever atomic assets upgraded their contract they'd also want to update their uh package that's being distributed that kind of wraps it in this way and that could be done through continuous integration and just automatically deployed right so so that's exactly um where i'm trying to get at with this mm -hmm. there is still so when we update the smart contract on chain of course this is a forced update for all integrators 
right? Mm-hmm. There's no way for them to use another version of that contract on the chain, like a legacy or previous version. Um, whereas they're not automatically upgraded in their front ends. Yeah, but that's always the case. That's why it's like <clears throat> it's going to be part of the responsibility of the developer of the plugin that is maintaining that plugin for that specific use case. So, for example, Atomic Assets, if they're doing like a major change that's mm-hmm. going to need all the sites to upgrade, like at least here, if you're using Worf, you're going to be better off because you're just sure. probably going to have to update that plugin, right? But it's and, still and their responsibility to disseminate to maintain that maintain it and maintain backwards compatibility yeah. ideally if they want people to use it because if they actually right. did that like all the sites will go down you know like exactly exactly that, which so. is which is a good thing right we don't want them to make breaking changes which then are automatically accepted by the sites and the sites do things they're not supposed to yeah exactly yeah. And even if you're writing out that like i'm trying to find it again um oh, i'm in the wrong repo if you were writing out all the straight up json or JS js objects like that's going to break anyways if your yeah. inputs change or whatever. Um, so at least this gives you a way to kind of automatically abstract that and uh, hopefully have an easier path than having to deal with all that manual JS changes. And then have documentation um, that stands, you know, uh, the changes yeah. in time. Actions on EOS are also only forward compatible right they're not backwards like if you you can't remove a parameter from an action i don't believe so okay you could remove it from the abi and like uh but someone still could use it like if they know what they're doing i see but it would throw errors if you tried to actually remove it from the implementation like you mean in a smart contract yeah, I think you have to add uh, binary extensions as new parameters, right? I'm not sure. Like, I don't write smart contracts, so I don't, don't want to give you false info. That's the case. Yeah, Nathan, I think that's right. If you change parameters, you got to do a table migration or have previously done uh, extensions, maybe ex- uh, the end. Right. Or yeah. just a new action or something. Yeah. Or, ha- yeah, that would break it. OK. Let's continue though. I think we're cool. Sorry for the sidetrack. <laughs> no, it's a good one. Um, I'm less involved in the contract kit, but this is good discussion to potentially bring back to like Johan or something, um, since he's spearheading the contract code generation side of things. Um, but I guess just to kind of encapsulate what the contract kit is, since even when we were working on the site map, we dove into this topic and really started talking about how these all play together. Um, The contract kit is a code generator for a specific contract. And things like the account kit are going to be the result of the code generation with additional logic baked on top of it. Like the account kit will have a portion of its code, specifically something like this, where it is output automatically through uh, maybe a command or through continuous integration or whatever it is. And then all the other code that lives on top of it, like the index itself well, i guess that doesn't have anything in it the account itself like it is going to have other data and other helpers that help manipulate that data like we have one here for getting a permission by name so you could just say get permission active and it's going to do that you know that loop that i'm sure we've all done where you have an account data response from the api and you're like okay here's the permissions array now i need to find the one that matches active and then parse that information out so it's that kind of helpers that will then be able to be baked on top of the code generation portion to really ease the experience for a lot of developers um the account kit is still really in uh an early state because we're still waiting for the code generation to be there and we're just manually committing what we think the outputted code will look like um and i guess one other thing that this has highlighted is that the dependency tree looks a little different than we originally thought and it's not dependency might be the wrong word because all of these kits can function but the the session kit is kind of the base layer of transacting and the contract kit is going to live 
optionally on top of the um, session kit. And then the account kit is going to live indirectly on top of the contract. So it goes from top to bottom. It's account to contract to session. And this relationship only exists if you're actually performing transactions. Um, and that's why the relationship now exists. But if you are only using these frameworks, like the contract kit or the account kit, to read data from the blockchain and get access to all those helpers, then there's no dependency, besides maybe the dependency of the contract kit generating a part of the account kit. Um, if you're not like if you're not actually performing transactions, then nothing requires the session kit. So we're going to have to come up with a chart of like this pseudo tree, pseudo dependency tree, um, just to maybe outline it somewhere better. But this was uh, something I think that was reinforced over the last couple of weeks as we've been doing development is that there's this was this previously unknown optional dependency tree that exists. So I just figured I would bring that up if there were any thoughts or since it kind of changes the way we've said it. Well, unless you want to clone functionality in, in both kits, which is generally a bad idea, I think that's the only option. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. And then just in the spirit of these calls and the evolution of these frameworks and keeping people up to date, we figured we'd bring up like those kind of fundamental things that may have changed uh, during the course of development. And these things will only affect the advanced user, right? Because the average user is going to like just import work, right? Or import everything. Like yep. they're not going to necessarily, you know, they're not going to be worried about their bundle size and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to care about these uh, separations or that you need to have you know the rest of it for account kit to work uh, in, in uh, transactional mode yep exactly so we're it's this approach we're taking a building from the bottom up primarily is in that we're now that we're putting the bricks on top of each other we're seeing these things and most people most developers won't actually experience any of this they'll just use a starter kit and this will all work um, but for those of us that are like really deep into this code and we've dealt with manually writing all this stuff in the past, it's good to look at each brick as we put it down. So that was just a brief note I wanted to put out there that was on my list of things to talk about. I am going to blow through a couple other just kind of general updates and then maybe dive into some files themselves because we have maybe 20 minutes left. Um, broadcasting is implemented. We went with the send transaction API endpoint for now because it is more broadly available. Only the chains that are running on Leap 3.1 or above, or endpoints that are running Leap 3.1 and above, are going to have send transaction too. So for now, the default just is send transaction. Um, it gets more even tricky than that. Like just because you have send transaction too does not mean you can use all the features of send transaction too, such yeah. as, you know, like uh, keep it uh, in kind of the mem of the node and re or to retry until it's, you know, for example, part of a block that's got finalized. Yeah. Like that depends on additional stuff that need to be enabled and they're not enabled by default in these. And the same, of course, goes for compute transaction. That's, I think, getting some changes now. But these ones also, I was wondering if you plan to uh, include them and have a way to auto query the API for potentially checking what is enabled and what is not. So that, like, like for example, what I do in like the bridge stuff is I need to wait for finality. So like I have to, like I have manually set if that API endpoint supports send transaction to, you know, auto retry and everything. Otherwise, like fall back to my own kind of local implementation that is not as efficient because obviously you need to keep checking like the block and check the transaction made it in it and all that stuff manually with many network calls versus in send transaction two where all that happens locally on the uh, API server and then you just get the response when it's all done. So the client is not making many calls, is literally just waiting for that same uh, call. So ideally, like uh, it would make sense, you know, because you know if you show the new developer send transaction and send transaction two. It's confusing while you know if, if almost like that whole process can be uh, abstracted 
and uh, and the API queried to find that information, or which I don't think is necessarily available now. Like you can send to send transaction to like an empty thing and figure out if you know, or like you can just do get info, I guess, and figure out the lead version. But that's not going to tell you if certain things are enabled or not on that node. Yeah, yeah that would make sense. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to tackle that soon, but I think that feature detection is probably a good thing. I mean, that API endpoint is a fairly light call uh, that could maybe happen towards the beginning. Like maybe that's even a plugin of some sort, or maybe it's just a native function of the session kit that it detects the capabilities of the API and warns you if you're trying to use an API that doesn't support something you're trying to do. Um, or auto falls back to the same functionality mm -hmm. that is abstracted mm -hmm. away. Like say, wait for Lim, for example, you know? So yeah. like the user could have an interface, uh, by interface, I mean, just like here, like the code for, you know, say like, okay, you know, broadcast, uh, wait for Lim or wait for how many blocks, like how some transaction uh, two does it is if you put zero, it means wait for lib. Otherwise, wait for inclusion uh, that is included and this many blocks passed, for example, uh, or were built on top. So yeah. um, I think that's, and that way, like the end user of Wharf, and I'm not saying this is a priority or anything, obviously, but I'm saying it's included. Yeah. The developer will just come, oh, yeah, I want to wait till at least, you know, say four blocks passed. So I know uh, it, like the chance of it being in a fork is much less likely. And I'm happy with that when someone else might put zero. But then the implementation underneath that code would be the one that's checking for the API, which you already do get info, I presume, to know what block height you're at when forming yep. transaction and stuff. So you're basically, whenever you did the first get info, you have that kind of information stored. And uh, and that's what you use to either use the same transaction to or the fallback. That basically, I did something that just like implements kind of how Diffuse did their guaranteed endpoint, very similar. Uh, but yeah, like that's what I think like long term would be ideal. So that way the developer documentation doesn't really change. And once everybody moves to send transaction two, you know, that extra code will never be run and can eventually be removed. But the documentation never changes. It's just building new knowledge versus relearning things, which is always, you know, a deterrent for developers. Yeah. Well put. And I that is either going to come, I think, in the form like we could probably do all of this with hooks right now, uh, or with plugins. I guess I to the developer, I think that these are going to be plugins, and then to the plugin developer, they will be hooks. Um, and I do think that there is the potential to manage some of this stuff within the hooks and the plugins themselves. Um, but having this singular point where it's always using send transaction, having that be customizable somehow through either a broadcast plugin or some sort of intelligent detection is long term, I think, a good solution. Um, and then, uh, this also could be uh, another discussion with, I guess, ENF or uh, whoever is working on Node EOS. Because I think that needs to be extended itself, what get info returns to give you that information. Because it doesn't make sense, or, actually, or have another status or you know features like endpoint or something, like yeah. uh, get features, uh, because it doesn't make sense to keep trying, you know, and seeing what like, like it just doesn't make sense to do like five, six calls to try to figure out, oh, does it support computation? Does it support, you know, whatever, send transaction two? But does it support retries and send transaction two? And, all this information doesn't exist currently in the API uh, endpoint. This is an API endpoint that potentially we can use. Um, like it does say, send transaction to and compute. Um, but most node operators don't actually expose this. So maybe this needs some attention to the point as to where this is more easily exposed or exposed by default. Um, I'm not entirely it's sure. It's a subset of it, like you know, like a subset of it exposed by default. Because I maybe yeah. some of it could be uh, problematic. Uh, I don't see why. Well, hmm. but yeah, right. like if they kept it not supported by default, there, there could be a reason. Um, 
but maybe not because these are all public like if they are if this return is true like you can find this list even if it's not exposed by just like you know trying yeah. them right like yeah, uh, so probing. exactly so uh maybe this like you said should be just set as the default to automatically be exposed uh, through the api and even maybe add it to like here for example it says compute transaction even though that endpoint might be available does it work yeah and what is the ddos on it or you know like 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 what's the limitations on it that are set by the by the node itself like is it for public use is maybe it's enabled but like i don't know maybe he has like an nginx rule or or like a firewall rule mm -hmm. that only allows it from a subset of or ips or something you know like it's it's almost like it has to be something that the node operator decides to show i think um and almost like advertise that hey we're offering compute transaction right yeah. or some transaction to versus something that's maybe automated and not really enabled supported or or would work efficiently on their server maybe there's a case to be made for a new api endpoint that is kind of a hybrid between the git info call and the git supported apis call where it is i don't know what this endpoint is called but it would return the information required to do uh the tapos the headers formation on the transaction like the head block time and or the head block num and the head block prefix or whatever uh and then it also returns information like a, a a collection of what you'd expect out of this showing what endpoints are available and then maybe even what the flags are on that endpoint so that way the client could generate the header of the transaction and then also know for this server what the best way to send a transaction would be like that maybe this is a, a potential feature request for nodios a brand new api that specifically designed for like pre-transaction information yeah no that makes sense i like that a lot yeah cool um Make our lives your, easier for sure yeah i'm gonna write down a quick note about that I don't know when to bring it up, but maybe it's just a GitHub issue on the leap repository or something with a description of kind of the goal to combine this kind of stuff. Um, no, that's a good idea that just randomly bubbled up here. Uh, kind of running through more notes. Uh, the transaction context, which we went over in the last meeting, it's this thing that all the plugins get access to, uh, this context. we had some debates internally over the last two weeks about how this works uh, because one of the things we started working on was what a resource provider plugin looks like and the resource provider needed access to fetch it needed access to more than just the uh, eosio core api client it needed the potential to reach outside of um you know your generic nodios api implementation so we rewrote the transaction context and now the context will have an api client to access uh you know normal nodios apis like get account and whatnot and it will also have an instance of fetch so now plugins can request resources from anywhere it doesn't just have to be a nodios instance um so that was a big change kind of refactoring a lot of the code uh, it simplified a lot of things. You no longer need to pass an API client ever to a session or to the session kit. You just pass an instance of fetch if you need one. Um, and if you don't need one, it'll automatically try to find one that's available. Like if you're using uh, Node.js version 18 and above, it'll just use the built-in fetch for you. Or um, web. Or what? Or, or just web, because web has yeah. built in fetch. In yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, and there's a, we lifted a chunk of code out of core that does that detection and put it directly here because it was woven into some other things. And we're figuring out how we can expose that long story. But, um, what's so yeah, the, so I'm, I, I think I, I got a little confused here. Um, what's the use case for also being able to reach outside of nodes? Uh, the 
the resource providers, like if we're starting to drive this model oh, a little like harder. Oh, like fuel and, and whatnot. Yeah. Right I now see. we okay. do have, like fuel is on eos.graymass.com and it looks like a native Node EOS API, but it is not. So there's the potential that like maybe we want to move, move fuel to be fuel.graymass.com and it works for all blockchains. Like you just submit a transaction to that endpoint and it will do its thing and return it regardless of which blockchain it is. But for that to work, we needed to be able to set a URL of where that API is. And the API client, um, like here you can see it's actually using the API client and this doesn't work. This is a early version. Um, because this is just going to call jungle4.graymass.com or whatever the API client is configured to use. So now the context has fetch. And in my local version, this is rewritten to just use fetch as opposed to an API client. So that way I can specify the full URL. It doesn't, it's, it's not locking me into a Nodios instance. The API clients are for accessing EOS IO APIs or Antelope APIs. And fetch is going to be for reaching out to anything else you might need to. Maybe after broadcast, you want to send it to a logging service. I don't know. Whatever, whatever you may need or to access. Before, or like before signing, you might need to, you know, fetch the price from an oracle or something to decide if the transaction is worth you paying fuel for it. And it's yeah. not spam, for example, you know. Yeah, exactly. So we figure there's going to be use cases and this context for the plugin developer is going to be their kind of toolbox for what's going on with this transaction, as well as some common things that they're going to be able to use. So um, this actually doesn't, I don't know, I, this is old code. So um, this was another thing I wanted to jump in on this call. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it necessarily. Let me quickly look at stuff. Um, you got five minutes, so no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think the big thing, one of the big questions I wanted to ask is we've been talking a lot about making Wharf approachable to Web 2 developers and using terminology that Web 2 might understand to interact with Web 3. So we're using the idea of the session right now. And this, this test right here, which you can find in use cases in general, is a Node.js test of Wharf, of the session itself. Um, it's fairly well documented. It showed, like, if this were not a unit test, all you would have to include would be a session and then, like, a private key wallet plugin to be able to sign transactions. You wouldn't need all of this. Um, but to create a session right now, I guess two questions is, does a session make sense, even when working in the, the Node.js context, instead of like, I want to make a new EOS instance and then I want to call transact on it, you'd be creating a session with the blockchain. Does that make sense to Web2 developers? And then secondarily after that, is there any way we can simplify what details of a session are? for somebody who wants to work in the Node.js context. Right now, you can see these are the options. This one is a test harness, effectively. And then to perform a transaction in its rudimentary form, this is all the code you need. So. What's that permission level up in the, like in the code above? That is, I suppose it would be useful if the variables were actually there. Uh, it's the account name at and the permission level. Got you. So it's add to that permission. Yeah. I can pull that up real quick. Uh, it's not under tests. Yeah, there's the mock permission level. It's using core 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 at test. Yeah, permission level doesn't sound correct to me because it implies there's different levels. Uh, it's more like, I guess, you say you got it right. It's more the authorization. Yeah. Who's authorizing the transactions. Um, just like, because permission level implies, as I'm saying, like levels, like, that, oh, which level should I put? Should I, maybe I need, like, if the transactions are the words, I think maybe I need a higher level or something. I don't know. Like, 
I know Dvorak was another does. gum, but it's, it's just yeah. a bit weird. Maybe for to to make it more approachable for not us developers, we could name it authority or something. Um, but it does have the level being the level of the permission on the account. So I could see maybe it making sense, but I I copied that just because that's what it's called in core. So but maybe it's maybe authority makes more sense. Like you specify which authority you're using. And then you specify which chain you're connect you're using with the ID and the URL. And then you just specify how you're going to sign transactions, which in the Node.js context, if you're signing, you'll use some sort of private key signer. Like the simplest thing for a new developer, I'll tell you, uh, but it's not necessarily what you want to use. But the simplest thing would be like account and permission, right? Like what they see on the Block Explorer, what they're going to see anywhere, they start checking that stuff. Is it will be like account, and then maybe permission is option, optional. You know that auto sets to active. Mm -hmm. That would be the simplest. You know, for them to inherently uh, or inherent, inherit, whatever that word is, mm -hmm. <laughs> inherit, inherently, inherently, uh, 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 you know, understand. Like when they see like account, they're like, okay, yeah, the account is associated with my key. Like the account I'm gonna use to do any action. Permission level just needs explanation. Like I wouldn't yeah. know what to write there uh, without going and looking at you know what it's expecting, so to speak. So but anyway, minor you, detail, but just just yeah. thought, since you're trying to focus on the new developer. Yeah, and that's good feedback. Maybe would it make sense for there to be two fields, one for account and one for permission that's optional? So most of the time you're just specifying an account and it'll default to active. But if you specify a permission, it'll use that as well. And it goes with the same idea of like this is this year uh, optimization meant for the new developer. We we guarantee he's gonna have an active account, an active key when he yeah. creates one. And chances are his active is the same as the owner, but without specifying, you default to active. And uh, you know the advanced user is gonna know. No, I want to use this other prim custom permission I created that can only do this action. You know, for example, for security yeah. reasons. But the average user is just going to put, oh, what's my account that's, that's going to do this? This one. Yep. And then for the like beginner, it gets even easier because the field is just called account. And they're like, yep. OK, I know what that is. Or maybe it's account you name or something. It. Yeah. Or account name, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. There's also the possibility, and I don't know if this is like, Great idea or not, but making it so the chain ID is not required. Like maybe you could just specify a URL and it'll. Yeah, call I never like get info. I would stop the, that similar things before, and I never require the chain ID. I always get it from get info because it's one of those things that are very simple to copy paste, but for a new person or a person that's you know getting into it, you're just like, oh my god, what's this hex I'm looking at? Yeah, and uh, it's it's just like there is no reason for it because especially if we go with the idea that. On the first call to get info, or you know, the chain ID could be part of the get whatever features or whatever we we're saying. Is you're still gonna do that call, you know? Like as soon as you know what chain you're connecting to, you are gonna do a get info at some point. Yeah, it's a very light call, so might as well like execute it and fill as much as you can uh, from it. Versus asking the user to manually put a chain ID that you know they make a mistake in, and then you know you have to answer support calls. That makes sense. That makes sense. Cool. No, oh, that's good feedback. Uh, did you have any thoughts on like calling these sessions? Does that do you think that resonates with web two or just web developers well, in general? Like session versus EOS instance or like Antelope instance or whatever? Yeah. Just the fact that like you're calling if if you're working in this context, like you're making a bot or a script or something that performs transactions, that you're creating a session with the blockchain. The only issue with session for me, like, uh, is automatically it feels for me like this is temporary. Like it's going to do something and close the session. But uh, true. Like more like connection or, you know, instance, like you said is more what I'd expect. Like, you know, you make a WebSocket connection. It's not going to, you know, close unless you close it, for example. Uh, 
I don't know, that's just like what I feel about session. Unless there's going to be supporting multiple sessions at the same time, which you, you do support. Um, yeah, that's definitely possible. Yeah, like I like the concept of session because I will be using it potentially in this kind of session uh, idea. But for the user, he might think like, oh, I need to make a new session every time I'm going to interact with it. Every time I'm going to make a transaction, for example which is obviously not the case you want to maintain that session yeah. but also if like on the other side if you're making connections to multiple chains say you know your site for whatever reason it needs to connect to different chains um session makes sense there you know kind of like a gmail session right um i don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with it personally uh, i okay. think session is actually the way i think about it makes makes more and more sense cool yeah we're really kind of looking at the terms we're using and making sure that they're going to be approachable like they kind of they at least resonate slightly you know if you have a a cookie session or a chase on web token session or some sort of other session in the web world that lets you read and write data hopefully oh, that kind of that kind of concept will translate over here and it's like oh okay yeah i grabbed a session and now i can do things with that session um yeah. So, and I prefer it that than instance because instance is more like used more in the older, you know, coding yeah. languages, I guess. And it's kind of not who you're expecting to come new into development. Yeah, exactly. So, I guess something we can think about as we continue to move forward, but raising the topic here at least maybe sparks some thoughts. Yeah. Even if cool. the thoughts lead to confirming the existing. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. At least we're putting that thought into it. So, yeah. So, yeah. And I think the other only kind of thing I wanted to jump on today um, was just that, like, I, this is something I've been working on. There will be commits um, probably coming in today or tomorrow for it as well. But this is a real full fledged example that actually uses fuel uh, in a like real environment against jungle. Um, yeah. and how a plugin would be developed to do something like that. This is written in the unit tests, but if this works out good enough, then I'm probably going to lift most of this code and actually publish it as the first plugin. Um, yeah. So we won't dive super deep into this today. We can maybe save that, and it'll be a little bit more refined by the time we get to it. Um, but the reason I did want to bring this up, and both for you and whoever else may be watching this later, um, is that we're looking for which types of actual plugin implementations we want to handle next. Um, just to put my current trajectory for what we're going to do next is that we're going to make a plugin for that leverages the compute transaction API endpoint, and that is going to help. Like it's going to return errors about whether the account needs RAM or whether it doesn't have resources or. Yeah, I've used it uh, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, it's going to give you the full thing, including a trace if, if, if needed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's quite nice. And then you can, and it will tell you exactly how much you're missing as well. Yeah. So that you can auto retry and bundle in the delegate bandwidth or buy RAM action if you need, you know, like offer exactly. the end user to like, oh, this is the issue. Do you want to automatically, automatically kind of handle it and uh, and just do it for them versus them trying to figure it out? Exactly. So this this resource provider plugin kind of does all of that in the backend code. Like Fuel actually calls compute transaction and then parses any error messages that may came, come out to modify the transaction. But the, this next plugin that we may experiment with is going to do all of that in the plugin and let the user correct it all themselves, whether that's through power up or staking or buying RAM or Rex for whatever chain still uses Rex. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's one example. But the other examples I have that we could potentially do um, are things like transaction failover um, I eventually want to get to something that we're doing IBC as an actual use case example in the unit test to make sure it works. Um, yeah. And then whatever other types of automated processes, those are kind of the ideas I want to start fishing out of the community and say, 
Like what is a common flow that happens that could potentially just be made into a plugin because we want to actually write unit tests to try that. And that's precisely what this file is. Well, that's great. And I think just by putting out the first plugin and showing the general um, approach to writing plugins for this uh, SDK is going to drive people, at least us, like to, to uh, also potentially start looking at this and using it to write plugins that also automate some things, like you said, uh, that will make use of hooks and everything else. Yeah. And then that's going to highlight like the weak points. Somebody's going to be like, I need this in the transaction context to be able to do this specific task, or um, I can't hook into the right point of the transact flow. And like that sort of back and forth interaction is really going to help shape up something like the session kit to be the tool that we all really need it to be. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> cool. I, yeah, I guess just to kind of end this, I kind of scrolled down to this, but this also is going to show kind of a future feature of what the context is going to be used for. The context nice. is providing you with data and options and information about the transaction, but the context is also going to be able to interact with the user interface if the, inter inter the user interface exists. Like at this point in the resource provider flow, this 402 status means payment required. And if there is a payment required for this transaction, we want to prompt the user before they sign that says, hey, this transaction is going to have a transaction fee to cover your RAM, to cover your whatever uh, resources you need. Do you want to accept and then either continue or abort what the plugin is trying to do? So yeah, and this is to emulate or like, you know, kind of like uh, just to have a fee, right? Like uh, Ethereum, basically. Yep. Instead of managing your resources, you just pay a fee, and then there's a fee resource managing, you know, server that someone provides and is taking a fee to, to do that on the behalf of people. Kind of exactly. like Matthias did something kind of similar in uh, when he was doing it, where you can use MetaMask to create accounts mm -hmm. and all that, and it works in a a bit of a similar way. Yeah. Our Anchor SDKs do this in the browser plugin, where you know if you if you try to perform a transaction and you're short on RAM, we throw you back a transaction fee that's like, here's what this RAM costs. Do you want to do this? And then it's a yes or no. Um, and then if you click yes, it says, you know, OK, here's your transaction to sign. It includes the cost of the RAM purchase. And if you click no, then it just sends the transaction to your wallet anyways. And you can try to sign, but it's going to throw a RAM error. It's like, but we told you so. That... <laughs> But it includes the, the transaction fee, or like mm -hmm. a, basically a transfer action from them to their resource provider. Yeah. But also it should include, of course, the action itself, like buy RAM, and yep. the payer would be, you know, the US provider and, and so on, I assume. Yep. And it'll yep. have the okay. signature for that transaction, and it will, like, it'll be an atomic operation where exactly. the funds are sent and the buy RAM action is performed. So, so before they can see, hook, basically. Yeah. 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 All of this, this plugin specifically, uh, you can see it's adding one hook, and it is a before sign hook, and then it calls this request on this class, which sprawls out into a whole bunch of logic with a whole bunch of other methods, um, just to show how a more advanced plugin could be done. And this is such a useful plugin, especially in EOS now with the whole yeah. EOS power up. Yeah. Uh, one of the other plugins I want to write is just a really simple one that'll offer power ups. Like it'll use yeah. compute transaction. It'll say you're short on CPU and net. It'll figure out how much CPU and net, and then like prompt you to do a power up, and then it will modify the transaction to add the power up so the transaction succeeded. And that's a way to use uh, to like pay a fee, but not pay it to anyone except the network. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. I think that's really going to make power up a lot more effective than it is today. Yeah. If people just have to click yes and see a cost, it's much easier for them to figure out how much they need to put in. Exactly. All that. Or even go to another place and do it, even if it's very simple in a UI. It's an extra step that they're more likely to click, you know, no or cancel or, or like, I mean, if it if it just fails, they're they're not likely to repeat it. Yeah. Especially with new users. And even going to like server side applications, they should be able to include that power up call. 
and yeah. maybe there's like a max fee or something. So that way, if you're running a backend script, like a Delphi Oracle price feed that feeds yeah. in prices, if if it's using that power up plugin and it detects that your your Oracle account doesn't have enough resources to submit a price feed, then it could just power itself up without you having to write that code. Like I would love yeah, that on our price feed. <laughs> for sure. Like uh, no, that's great. But uh, there's also the the problem now is you almost need to have your own API endpoint for this because it's gonna be costly to the provider providing that compute transaction if he allows everybody to use it publicly. Uh, and say if you're doing like Delphi Oracle or even something more extreme, like say you're doing a resolve on something uh, that is you know CPU intensive and runs more frequently than say Delphi, then you're going to really abuse that uh, API endpoint of the compute transaction. It's almost yeah. like you want to have an option where, especially for the power up version, because the power up could last longer. You know, um, just thinking of, but like almost like having an an after fail hook. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like uh, like after fail for resources hook or something like that. Like I'm just freestyling it now, but like I see that use case where. You know, say if I'm pushing stuff, like I don't want to abuse the compute transaction, especially on a back end that like I'm running continuous stuff. So if I need resources, I'm going to need a bunch of it uh, versus just check on this one transaction I'm doing today, uh, you know, with compute transaction. Like on a back end, it might make more sense to have it after a fail. Like when one command fails, then retry it with a power up, like power up and retry it, you know? Yeah. Uh, even if it's atomic, and then the next one, wait for the next fail before you power up again, and you still have that max limit that you can set every twenty four hours or whatever like uh, option is going to be given. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And some kind of after, maybe maybe like a failure hook almost. It's like if this fails at any point, we're gonna here's a point that you could hook into to potentially correct the problem. Yes, but also that hook has to be able to specify the problem in kind of layman terms. Not layman terms, yeah. but like in a, in a map, like an unknown error map kind of thing. Like either it's CPU, I need more CPU, and how much I need, I need more RAM, how much I need, so on and so forth. And different from like uh, a full failure where it's, it's not resource related, you know? Yeah. That potentially could be an after broadcast hook where it takes the response of the broadcast and then could potentially like issue a new transaction that's corrected. It's like, well, we yeah, know the last one failed. Yeah, that actually yeah. makes sense. You don't need an additional hook. It is an after broadcast uh, hook that checks certain failures, but it is yeah. like would live in the after broadcast. It doesn't need an additional hook. It's just the after broadcast will be providing uh you know basically reading that error coming from the api and like maybe formatting it into a more uh easily you know like <clears throat> like actionable information yeah 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 that might make a lot of sense good thoughts cool so it's uh, cool. kind of 9 15 p.m yeah uh, yeah yeah so <laughs> we I should probably wrap this up. Getting louder and louder. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't wrap it up, they're gonna come in and wrap it up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Uh I made it through my list besides wanting to get more in depth on this resource provider stuff, but I can push that off to another one. Um so yeah, I guess we can end it here and we will do this again in a week or two. So oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric.